This is the Practical Culture Spoiler Cast, a podcast devoted to diving deeper on the TV and movies, um, maybe sometimes the video games, that we and you are into. I'm your host, Logan Bow, podcasting from Lehigh, and I'm joined, as always, by the one, the only Bob Caswell in the Bay Area. How are you, Bob? I'm doing all right. How's it going with you? Just hanging out. You know me. Nice. This week, we, sto- we spoil A Star is Born, and we'll also talk about what we're consuming and even make a top five or so list by the end. If you like what you hear, look for us in your usual podcast app and at practicallyculture.com, also on YouTube. We recommend to check it all out if you're into the show. We're spoiling TV, movies, probably sometimes video games. It's the Practically Culture Spoiler Cast. Let's rock. Oh, man, it is good to be back, Bob. We're still rolling along here. And before we get into the spoiling, as always, let's chat a bit about what we're watching or playing. I'll even go first. (laughs) I have to admit, I have have had a crazy week. I hate using that excuse very often because a lot of weeks are crazy. But I will tread it out this week. Mm. Um, But one thing... I'm very excited about is that we're finally legit into movie awards season. So there are a lot I'm looking forward to. Uh, the next couple of weeks, we got First Man this week. Uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me seems Oscars y, though I don't know if it'll be as much my thing, but we got to make sure to get the Oscar movie spoiled for the people mm-hmm. to help with their homework. That's right. Um, oh, and based on conversations with you, I think I'll pick up the new Assassin's Creed this week. Give that a spin. <sighs> Yes, I converted you. Well, we'll see how well the conversion holds, but um, I think, yeah, I'm... But I'll have the first discussion. (laughs) That's right. Are you done or do you have more to your list? No, that's it. What do you got cooking? TV, video Uh, games, movies, whatever. Yeah, yeah. So Assassin's Creed for sure. I'm I'm starting to play that a bunch more. I just finished uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider and mini reviewed it. Um, And I'm still playing uh, Forza Horizon 4, but it's a racing game. So, you know, I can sort of float there in the background assassin's creed odyssey is really the main video game that i'm focused on um as far as tv i still haven't finished ozark season two i have to get around to it i only have two or three episodes left but i can already tell i just don't like it as much as season one now from listening to buzz out there i think a lot of people like it as much or more but you know not you huh i mean we'll I get to it not, yeah maybe the last podcast, but sorry go yeah. ahead i was just gonna say maybe the last three episodes um, bring it all together. I, I could be just stalled in the middle and just need to reboot it in my head in, in terms of how I see it. But um, I did give Maniac a try and I'm not sure if I'm going to stick with it, but I think you also started watching Maniac with a uh, uh, friend of the show, Jonah Hill. That's funny. He's not really a friend of the show, but I, I wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, we do like him. We, we've spent some time talking about how his career has gone. Pretty well, just like uh, I think we'll mention Bradley Cooper's Bradley Cooper. career seems to have a similar like credibility increase. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, I guess that's it at this point. Uh, I'm also watching all those same Oscar homework movies. Um, I'm excited for Oscar award season. Um, so we'll see. All right. Well, ready to get to this? Yeah, let's do it. A star is born. A successful musician helps a young singer find fame as they fall in love and his age and alcoholism send his own career into a downward spiral. Starring Lady Gaga, Bradley Cooper, and Sam Elliott. Directed by Bradley Cooper, uh, his first main movie, I think. Uh, written by Eric Roth, who, great to have on the backup side of you, of, of your writing team, because he won the Oscar for Forrest Gump and he's written a bunch of other movies. Bradley Cooper also has a writing credit as well as Will Fetters. What did you think, Bob? Yeah, so this is a good movie. I um, both enjoyed it and was touched by it. So some words that come to mind are maybe tragic, soulful, musical, but I will say also a little distant. There were aspects of the characters that I wanted to, um, for as close up as it was, I, I, I saw some things missing as well. So, But overall, this is a, a solid easy to recommend, um, heavy material at times, drama, but also very um, enjoyable. The music is super good too. Cool. Well, I, uh, I loved it, I will have to say. I mean, it's just, uh, just a, the kind of movie that is both really good movie and the kind of movie that I just enjoy um, really a lot. I mean, it won me over in a way that not all great movies do. Sometimes I think a movie is great. Sometimes I love the movie. It's not always the same. But it reminded me. It's in the category of movies that I liked, like uh, Damien Chazelle's movies Whiplash and La La Land that I just loved and I thought were good, or a lot of Taylor Sheridan's work or Joe Swanberg. 
Mm. Um, and that's, that's the, the main thing. It hit me, not really a crier, but it, it, uh, it got me in the gut multiple times. Uh, I thought, I think it's best thought of as, as the love story between Bradley Cooper's Jackson Maine and Lady Gaga's Alley. Um, and that helps me smooth over a lot of, a lot of imperfections, I suppose. But, um, yeah, I loved it. I recommend people see it. I love that you loved it. That makes me love it or like it even more. I really liked it. I could go with love, sure. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess we should get into it. It's um, uh, My praise isn't quite as high. I mean, you mentioned a lot of the, the, the staples of, of Logan's uh, Hall of Fame. I wonder if Bradley yeah. Cooper is going to start making his way onto that list. We'll see. <laughs> Especially as director, that'd be interesting. I mean, yeah. uh, I don't want to call this like Oscar bait. Um, in the formulaic sense. It's obviously a labor of love from Bradley Cooper. This is the movie he wanted to make. He uh, poured his soul into it. Um, I, mean, I don't know why I'm saying this. I guess I'm trying to give him a compliment somehow. But uh, I, I, it, I, it feels like a, sort of a one-off. I mean, maybe Bradley Cooper could, um, could prove me wrong and I was just going to go into the directing phase of his life. Um, but I, I don't know if he'll be one of the, the directors that I just follow and absolutely love no matter what. Because on the other hand, I think he's even better as an actor in this movie than as a director. And so I hope he uh, sticks with that as, as his day job. Yeah, me too. Um, so what are, what are some things you liked? Um, oh, one thing I didn't say on the main show that I have written down here for my notes is one of the things that I really liked as a theme throughout the movie was it's small, it's very small, but it is a small taste of what it's like just to be a, a working musician. And I kind of liked how normal it seemed in that aspect of it. Jackson Maine had been there for a while. Um, it obviously didn't solve his problems in life, but at the same time, it's pretty awesome to be a rock star in a lot of ways. Um, but I liked just how, oh yeah, this is, this is our job. We could be lawyers or we could be MBAs of tech companies or pastry cooks or whatever. And a lot of the story could be similar, not a hundred percent, but just the, the scenes, the, the texture of the movie could be similar, I guess. Um, they're just people living that life emphasis on the people part. Yeah, I like that too, although it did feel somewhat effortless, but maybe by design because they're both super good at what they do. And so even when they had, you know, what we would consider like day-to-day -day struggles or conflicts at work, theirs were like uh, Allie at one point just wasn't used to recording uh, with a backing track or something. And then, and then Jackson was like, oh, well, what if I brought a piano in here and we can record the track because she's not familiar with how to do recordings. And so some behind the scenes, how the sausage gets made, but then it's, it just takes like one solution and then she's got it. She's back to being like a super gifted, talented person. But I, I like that though, overall. Well, I really like that scene that you just mentioned. It is in that vein. It's just like, hey, you got some talent, you've practiced a lot, but in terms of how we do it here, um, it's like, uh, like, I don't know, like I might be rolling out some bread in the pastry kitchen or something and the, the executive chef, he isn't like my direct supervisor, but he just comes like, hey, roll it like this. It just is easier. Like, oh, thanks. Or just whatever. I just felt like it could be in any sort of job that way. Yeah, that's a fair point. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, so I'm trying to think of how we're going to tackle the spoiler part of this movie. And um, I feel like the, some of the exact details, the plot by plot, um, uh, aren't necessarily the most important. Not that I'm going to, not that I'm going to skip over things that are major, but I want to talk sort of about like events or scenes um, that we can spoil um, mm. and whatever, any relevant details will obviously fill in. We're not going to shy away, but I don't know that it's, uh, it's necessarily the play by play that is the most important here. So, okay. That works. Really get into this. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we get a ton of info from the first several minutes, right? We see Jackson Maine performing at a sold and con sold out concert. Jackson Maine obviously being played by Bradley Cooper. And immediately we know he's like, he's good at this, you know, music thing. He's very charismatic on stage. And, uh, Actually, I'm going to pause there. I, I feel like one of the uh, insights we have about this is um, <laughs> charisma, whatever. I guess I'm just sort of thinking about this as I say it. But mm. I think of some of the main performing skills, singing, dancing, acting. I feel like acting, being great at acting is underrated as a way to be good at the others. Like if you can act and put like the, the stuff other than vocal technique in your song, then maybe that actually goes a long way to, to making you be a star or yeah. to do the performance part of dancing or whatever. Anyway, uh, it's just, um, 
well, maybe I'll put it this way. A lot of times you see actors trying to sing, even in the My Beloved La La Land, Brian Gosling and Emma Stone, <laughs> and they don't, they don't quite nail it the way someone who's like a trained singer or musician will do. But Bradley Cooper, he, he had something. He really caught something there. I think so too. Um, and we see that right at the beginning. Right at the beginning. It's kind of this hybrid uh, country rock. I, I, I don't know if I want to describe it as rock first, country second, or vice versa. I, I call it like a bluesy, rootsy rock. That's sort of how I think of it. I don't know if we have too many people making that kind of music right now who are big stars. but Yeah, which is kind of a shame because I saw his act and I was like, dude, I would see this live. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, yeah, very soulful, and but still rock heavy with, with, with uh, riffs and... Um, it, it was an intense show, it seemed like, I mean, from what we saw of it. And Bradley Cooper delivers with kind of that, almost like an Eddie Vedder sort of voice, um, okay. but, but, but almost better. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, well, that, that is, I guess, the interesting thing. Um, I mean, I was trying to think of what kind of rock star Jackson Maine is, because he is huge star, blues-based rock. But you're right, he gets that cool factor and he's definitely not like a Nickelback or a Creed or other bands that have significant backlash against them. <laughs> right. Like, it's like the, um, as we're going to mention in just a second, but like uh, even at the drag bar, people were like, oh, wow, this is a cool guy. Not like, oh, man, of all the people I had to walk in this bar, would it have to be him? <laughs> yeah, but he's also not just straight up Garth Brooks or, you know, like the other stereotype yeah. on the other side of the aisle or whatever. Um, he's kind of got the best of both worlds because he's got some country swagger and style and clout from that world but then he's got just like straight up rocker anthem riff you know solo guitarist cred from the other side um it, again it's kind of this hybrid of music that um I, I would be much appreciated in real life and it's on spotify it is appreciated i listen to it i i've been listening to it and i like it <laughs> uh i have too i i did read that um that one version of this story was uh, inspired maybe like by Kurt Cobain. Oh, um, which I can kind of see in terms of like how society or how the culture views him. A lot of, a lot of cool factor seems to be there. It's not just like vapid rock star. Um, it's like people think of him as cool at the same time. And so maybe Kurt Cobain has some of that. Yeah. And also Kurt Cobain is a good example of how, he was part of a band, but it was still him that was kind of the main driving force behind the persona, at least in the beginning. Um, and I got that vibe here too. Like I didn't think it was the Jackson band or it was just his name. I felt like it was, it was the band, but he was the front, you know, he, he was the frontman and, and like uh, lead singer, lead guitar player. But I still felt like it was very much a band, not a not a singular personality. Yeah, I, I think it was a little unclear on that, but it did feel maybe kind of like that. Or I don't, maybe it could have seen him being a solo act, but like a solo act who started in a band? I don't know. It, it's hard to know. Hard to say, yeah. Um, anyway, so that's where we get like the at first instant. It seems like, oh yeah, this guy's good at what he does, good music, and he's he's a star and he's cool. But after, after we see that... Um, the next thing we know about him is that all he thinks about afterward is just getting a drink and an hour and a half car ride home is just way too long out of the question. So he, um, he stops in at a bar. Um, is it his kind of bar? The guy there says, maybe it's not. It's like, well, do they have alcohol? That is my kind of bar. Um, but what we do see there is that um, Allie, played by Lady Gaga, is a, she's a young singer and she's been doing like catering or working banquets at a big hotel or something along those lines. She pretty much hates it. Not that that's an amazing job. Probably a lot of people hate it. But her <laughs> one joy in life is singing. And the only crowd that really gets her is a drag queen crowd, which also makes me laugh because the real life Lady Gaga is definitely right at home in the drag queen, queen crowd. <laughs> But she performs and she is great there. And that's where I first realized, oh, I'm really glad they got Lady Gaga to do this because when she's supposed to be great on screen, she's like legitimately great. And so I can appreciate her the way the drag queens do and the way Jackson Maine obviously does too. Yep. She totally nails that first performance. Jackson is watching unbeknownst to her. Well, I guess she sort of figures it out mid-performance, or does she? I don't know, but it doesn't affect her. She just is straight into the performance and just nails it for the for the crowd. It's she's at home in that in that bar, and um, yeah, and it ends up being an audition she didn't realize she was having. <laughs> but Jack's amazed. Um, they have a drink together. Um, Allie 
like we learned that she says it's her looks that have kept her from being successful. And uh, Jack says he, he likes big noses. Um, <laughs> and uh, this is another interesting moment for me. Uh, we talk about looks and success and how they're, um, how they're correlated. Um, because, I mean, I, in my mind, they're obviously straining for something about Lady Gaga they could point to for her to look like not a complete star. And they actually did it pretty well with the, the nose thing. Because it's uh, it becomes like a, a thing, like a part of their relationship. It's like flirty, comes up a bunch of times later on the movie. And it's just like one of those inside jokes that couples developed. It's part of their story about how they fell in love. Yeah, so I that, like that. And I like that they made it feel real. Like w- when you see her in the first half of the movie where she's just Allie before becoming a sensation, um, she looks normal, but she doesn't look Hollywood. But she's yeah. fine. She's she's pretty, uh, and Lady Gaga's pretty. And but you could also see why uh, whatever asshole studio execs, as they were positioned in a way, would see her look and be like, "Yeah, that would take some work." And I don't know, pass. <laughs> and I'm and I'm not saying I'm saying that, but I'm just saying they did a good job of threading that needle, so to speak. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out there is um, you know just about looks specifically because later on, Ali's dad played by. Andrew Dice Clay, remarkably well in my mm-hmm. view. He like explains this whole concept that they're trying to advance in the movie. And that is that, well, I mean, in his case, people apparently told him that uh, he was better than Frank Sinatra. But as he says, oh, I didn't have the old blue eyes that Frank had. Now, blue eyes is an interesting thing to say because mm-hmm. Bradley Cooper as Jack obviously does have blue eyes. And I also don't think I'm going out on a limb when I say that Bradley Cooper could be thought of as a very handsome man <laughs> so yes. when he plays a rock star he's not a counter example at all to the idea of looks mattering a whole lot if you're going to make it in that industry <laughs> right he's a sexy man yeah I mean, he's uh, yeah he, he does a good job he's got a he's, he's got it all <laughs> um so anyway uh but they hang out Allie and jackson and then i guess it's a it turns out to be a pretty big plot point that Allie ends up punching an overbearing fan of jack's and then jack takes um takes her to a grocery store. He takes some peas to her hand and she ends up singing a little song that she's been working on for him. And I like this sort of almost incidental moment, but it, what's not incidental is how they're just interacting with each other, bumping up against each other socially, sort of speaking. And you can tell the sparks are starting to develop, a um, little blossoming into some sort of proto relationship at this point. Yeah, and it's it's very charming because it's it is very natural the dialogue and the interactions and it's very fast but love is fast sometimes and it and it worked for me. So when he drops her off in the morning, um, he invites her to come to a show that night, and you know, a little of this, a little of that. Eventually, she decides to go, partially the urging of her father again, as we mentioned, played by Dice. So when she decides, she's like she just jumps in the car that's been waiting for her all day, goes to the plane that's been waiting for her all day. Um, she gets there in the middle of the show. Um, she makes it backstage. And I, I thought this moment was another really exciting one for me. I'd be interested to see if it is anything idiosyncratic about me or if you felt similarly. But um, when she gets there, Jack like stops the show. He's got a, an arrangement worked up of Ali's song. And he, he goes to her, talks to her just off stage, And he's like, you better come out here and sing with me because I'm going to do it either way. Like, you don't want me to mess it up. Um, And I don't know about you, Bob, but here, personally, as a mostly amateur performer, a singer, that's the kind of moment you just like dream of, fantasize about. You're getting this random chance to perform at something big and having it go just like amazingly well, just like it did for uh, for Allie there. And it just was like thrilling and exciting the way he made it happen um, and had like realized, oh, you're special. I'm going to give you the chance that you always deserved. It's like, yeah, I love that. Yeah. This was maybe the first tear inducing moment of the of the movie for me like i this whole scene even though part of it is captured in the previews um just seeing it end to end play out you are really rooting for her and you just you could just feel that being a special moment and and it really is and it works really well although there's a little part of me that's conflicted because because <laughs> part of me is like but in the long run yeah maybe don't do that though like it's probably <laughs> you know dragging somebody out on stage to perform um 
that's a that's a that's a, that's a tricky move. It's not always destined to work out like that. <laughs> well, I mean, you're right. It probably wasn't prudent or wise, but that's part of that's part of what makes it mysterious. He had a hunch, and it worked out great. And that just that makes it feel like destiny. Yeah, yeah, it worked. It, it was great. That was an awesome scene, and the song that they do together with the arrangement and the harmony and the acoustic guitar and just like everything was like, oh wow, he really um, pulled out all the stops and got the band to really um, follow through on this vision of his for her song. And it was just really touching. Yeah, I, I, that, that was when I first thought, oh yeah, I think, I think this might be a, a full, you know, four plus star movie that I love <laughs> once, once we hit that one for me. Right. Uh, so then they, they tour. He, she like comes along on his tour and, and does a little bit here and there. But um, we also realize just how drunk that Jack is some of the time. I mean, yet another good scene happens there when um, it, they go back to his hotel room. It looks like they're going to get it on. And she's like, I just need to go to the bathroom quick. Uh, but then she comes out and he's basically passed out. And the other thing we see there is how much Bobby, who's played by Sam Elliott, takes care of him. and I. I can't remember if we knew they were brothers at this point. I didn't quite figure out that they were brothers no, until not later yet. on. Yeah. But, but something was going on there. But that, that scene said a lot, again, about their relationship, about how his drinking is going to already be interfering with any relationship they might have, her disappointment, but also being drawn to him. Um, I, I felt like we got a lot of good stuff from that scene. Yeah, and uh, but then he wakes up in the middle of the night or it's, at some point, right? But... Um, yeah, it was interesting that that first attempt at something sparks flying in the more direct way um, it had a false start. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah. So they go along sort of like this. Pretty soon this manager-producer dude named Rez introduces himself to Allie and offers her a deal because he's been doing so well on the tour here. And uh, I guess Jack doesn't really love the idea, but he supports her and wants the best for her. And... And then starting here, we get to the part where Allie's career starts to take off. And some of the early things we see is that she tries to take a stand for some, you know, for artistic integrity, like uh, not going platinum blonde. And uh, at one point in the moment, she feels like, you know what, cancel the, cancel the, the backup dancers. But uh, she's constantly fighting, even from that point, with Rez, who scolds her for those things. You need to trust me, he says. <laughs> but is she like, so here's the thing. Um, yeah, talk to me. Yeah, I was so fascinated by Allie's story because she was she was like getting some tiny, tiny little concessions on her manager's side by saying like, okay, maybe not backup dancers this time or I'm not going to go platinum blonde, but I'm going to do my hair orange instead uh -huh. and still kind of go with the pop star look. And then um, as we get into the movie, we see more and more of the production value and the persona that she is having created for her. And I don't get the impression that as a little girl thinking she'd have a career someday, that this is how she would have crafted her image. I feel like it was very much uh, an indictment of the music industry in a way. It, well, that's one topic. But then the other topic is just her as a personality. Allie is both super strong as the non-drunk one in the relationship. And she's, she's working hard. You see her doing dance moves and dance numbers and, um, going through the motions that you do if you're going to be a successful star, but you never see her with a, with a real win. All of those little things where she's jabbing a little bit, ultimately she just gives in. And I get, again, I, I want to say there's some sort of defeat there in who she becomes, but it's not really told because that's not the story that's being told. It's, it's told very slightly and indirectly. Are, are you with me or do you think I'm a little no, off? No, I am. And actually the way I want to focus maybe what you're saying and ask you a question to see what you mm. say is, um, and it's a complicated question, I guess, but do you, do you think that, um, cause I wasn't thinking this at the time, but now knowing how it turns out and tragedy, but do you think, um, that they were sort of setting it up to where the part that caused the most friction with Jackson and, um, Allie was the slick producer, part and as the more she went there the harder it was for jack um i mean not not that ali owed jack anything in, in that sense because his authenticity is struggling with what it means to be a real person or to an authentic artist is something he obviously struggled with just later on we see that he has to get totally fucked up to go on stage with that corporate gig 
But um, if it had gone differently and she didn't have a res really making her slick, that maybe they could have found a more long-term viable way to, um, to coexist together and have a relationship. Again, thinking of it as a love story, not as a career story. Yeah. See, I was annoyed at both of them because <laughs> they were both too much of, they were both giving in to their personas too much. On the one hand, um, Allie really should have taken control of her career a little more. She didn't need to go as far as she did to be as successful as she could be um, with her voice and, and her skyrocketing, you know, claim to fame based on that original performance and blah, blah, blah. So she was giving in too much. And then on the, on the flip side, Jackson was worrying about things in terms of authenticity that were very nitpicky. Like the fact that you have to play a corporate gig, fine, whatever. You still wrote your songs. You still get a, you still get to sing your stuff. You still get to have the look you have. Well, like, are you, are you the right person to say this? Cause I know you've enjoyed one of your favorite <laughs> rock bands at a corporate gig, Bob. <laughs> it's true. Right. <laughs> I'm like, don't worry about it. You're fine. It's you. I love you for other reasons. But then Allie, I do want to chastise a little bit and be like, Hey, you don't need to give in. Jackson's right. But then Jackson, you're only right to a point. Like you can do corporate gigs and not feel so crazy shameful about it that's not the worst thing in the world i don't know maybe that's me no i mean that's there. enough for now i mean not that i'm hiding anything or want to avoid spoiling or something but just uh, toward the end when you know things come to a head i'll, I'll maybe more to say about that once okay. we put a little more of the pieces in play once we've gotten out of the opening and into the middle game here um but I, th I think that is one of the more interesting themes of the movie what you have to give up for success or what you may give up for success that you didn't have to give up for success. I think that's an interesting theme the, the show wrestles with. Yeah. And there's also one point where it's like, Oh, I got to do this corporate gig. Like he, almost like he has to do it for the money. And I'm like, it wasn't it like 20 minutes ago where you had a private jet just wait, standing by. For, Maybe it's because he does corporate gigs. <laughs> I guess. Uh, yeah. He, he does say this thing. Like I got to do this thing. I won't be here for your career. This, this uh, first few shows, but I've made peace with it. Like, Oh yeah. Have you? <laughs> right. Could, that is really the next thing that happens, so we don't have to talk about it at some point. But, but yeah, he goes, and I think it's Nashville. I know this. Yeah. This is one of the weird points. We talked about it on the main show a little bit. How it gets a little muddy here, but he flies. I think to Nashville, has to get wasted, drunk on pills just to go out there. He can barely stand, but he, he does his gig. Um, and uh, at the let's see, where am I in my notes here? Um, he says he's made peace with it, like I say, but he has to get super high. Uh, and I think it's in Nashville because of what happens later on. Anyway, he's supposed to head home to see Allie's performance, but he's super drunk, high, and he just passes out in the middle of town where his friend Noodles, who happens to live in Nashville, played by Dave Chappelle, finds him and helps him home. Um, and I guess what I'm going to footnote here is that, speaking of which, what a great scene and performance by Dave Chappelle. We see a lot of it in the uh, trailer. But it's just this dude being friends with Jack, and it's not a huge part, but it's uh, it's like really nice. Just a nice little moment of like, oh yeah, I like watching what I'm seeing. Yeah, like a wise old friend. It's a, like a sage, but just a Dave Chappelle version of that, and it and it really works. Um, it's a very very dreamy, mystical sort of thing in a way because it is con convoluted or confusing. It's like where, how did he get here? Where does he live? How do they know each other? What's the deal? It's, but it doesn't really matter. The story just. It's, it's about the conversation and the point in, in time of the story as it's happening. And you sort of just fill in the blanks, even if like the edges are all hazy because you're like, I don't really know what's going on, but I don't need to, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess his friend lived there and he happened to get drunk at just the right time to be found. Whatever. Yeah. Um, but uh, so Noodles apparently calls Allie or somehow Allie finds out where Jack is. So after her, her gigs with Rez, where they fight a little bit, she jumps on a plane and finds him. She yells at him a little bit, justifiably so, of course, yeah. that, that he can't just pass out and expect her to come find him. Um, and uh, at this point, I'm starting to realize, it's, it's interesting how Jack had been holding things together with his drinking. Like he gets that motorcycle early on. He's like, I'm not getting on that thing with you drinking. Hey, no, I'm good. And when, he was, when she was just a backup singer for him, his life seemed to be going great. But now that her career is going where it is, uh, it seems to coincide with him not holding it together um, as much. And I don't think he resents her or anything, but uh, it's just 
if she's there, then he keeps it under control. And if she's doing her own thing, then he doesn't have that thing that is going to keep him holding it together. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. It's not like he blames her or is frustrated by her stardom, but indirectly it's kind of correlated because it just draws them apart. And I mean, there is, they do have a conflict at some point, but it's feels like still pretty tame compared to what it could have been in terms of like her authenticity and what she has to do and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I agree. So anyway, Jack makes a little ring out of a guitar string proposes to Allie and they get married that day. And this is the part where I thought it must be in Nashville because of this old church. It seemed music-y somehow. But am I just pulling that to my ass? I guess I could Google it right now. But it seems like it happened in Nashville. They get married. It's nice. Yeah. Um, Allie's career keeps going, though. And they get back. And she does this weird performance on Saturday Night Live that whenever I read or hear other people talk about it, they say they really don't like it. And I guess it was sort of manufactured. That's, purpose, That's yeah. the whole point of it. Like, I... I think we might read or hear some of the same people. And I was confused by that. I thought that this was interesting commentary on the music industry. Um, like here she is the talented person for her voice and, and it's just not on display. And it's like a Britney Spears bit, you know, <laughs> and uh, she's just got to do the dance patterns and do some repetitive, like almost pseudo rapping with a uh, heavy beat and <laughs> not using her voice at all. And uh I'm not saying that pop is maybe it's a little exaggerated and it's a little rude, but I think it's, it's not rooted in some alternate reality. I think that's a, not not a bad representation of what a lot of music is nowadays. So there you go. You got to pay the bills. I know how that is. (laughs) Um, But also at that Saturday night live performance, Bobby somehow shows up, um, says he's managing Willie. He talks to Jack uh, backstage and they kind of sort of reconcile. Jack's like, um, Hey, I've been meaning to, to say, um, you can come back, but Bobby's like, listen, life is easy without you, Jack. And they don't start working together again, but at least the brother aspect of the relationship seems not at DEFCON one, at least anymore. Right. Yeah. They're, they're patching things up. Yeah. So Ali gets nominated for a Grammy. Um, but now Jackson does start to get a bit resentful. He, now they have this, this, another great scene. Well, great in the sense that it's painful. Um, where he has a fight when she's in the bathtub and he accuses her of selling out and he even gets mad enough that he calls her ugly, which is a huge thing to say since we know that was a big insecurity of hers um, and that he had made a thing of saying, no, no, you're beautiful to me. But now if he says you're ugly, it's like, wait a second, were you just lying to me this whole time? Anyway, I could see how she'd be super upset about that yeah, whole thing. For sure. And I just feel like they were in the moment struggling to find the right words because what he was trying to say is I think... You're, who you've become is ugly. Who you are is this persona is ugly when there's so much beauty independent of what they're doing to you to make you beautiful on top of what you already are. Like he just, he's just not finding those words and he just blurts things out and then he kind of comes back and regrets it. But I thought that that was a powerful scene. It was very uncomfortable, but it, it was, it, it seemed realistic. And yeah. like, yeah, I, but I, as soon as he said that, I was like, ooh. <laughs> Yep. Um, so then they go to the Grammys and he's drunk AF as the kids say, and she's having her moment and he just like stumbles on stage and he's high too. Drunk. Yeah, whatever. Um, but he's fucked up. That is for sure. And it's, he makes a scene in a very bad way, super embarrassing. Um, really distracts everyone from one of the biggest moments in her career getting that recognition but and it's bad it's bad. It's, it's really bad in fact if i were to give the movie a little bit of a ding <laughs> i felt like it was already bad even when he was off to the side and they you see him stumble and then he gets up on there and then you're like oh now it's really bad and then he pees himself and i'm like okay i mean <laughs> It just felt like we're taking it to 11 for the movie effect, but there's probably a reason that's never really happened. <laughs> the pro- probably security would have come up and it still would have been a huge scene if security would have, would have had to take her own husband, who's this famous rock star off. Yeah. It still would have been bad enough, but you're right. Probably something like that would have happened at the actual crap. <laughs> a little exaggerated, but it's fine. We get the um, point. But uh, anyway, he's like, yeah, I guess we're going to go to rehab or, I can't remember exactly how that was. He decides or someone takes him. Anyway, he's in rehab next week. Right. And um, 
so Ali visits him there and he, he tearfully apologizes. I think that he, he really feels bad. He wants to get life on track. I mean, I think we've seen that the whole time. Um, yeah. And her influence on him has helped and sometimes things have helped him go badly. But, but he, he, starts, he starts doing a little bit better with, uh, with rehab. Um, but then as he comes home and he plays with his dog, uh, and things seem to be on the upswing. Uh, our old pal Rez visits him. And he, he really, in a very, you know, biting sort of way says, hey, listen, she's not going to tell you this, but you are fucking up her career. You are the reason she isn't doing better. And that really stings him because he, uh, he knows that partially. He knows that he's done bad things for her career by embarrassing her and other things, but he's really trying to get back on track. And so anyway, it's just a, it's a hard thing. And I actually... This part was very powerful to me because I, I feel like I can sort of relate at times in my life when you've made some mistakes that maybe you can't recover from or you're trying to get your life together, but it's just not working. And you feel like, well, maybe there's no point. I know it felt like a very man sort of thing to, to be confronted with and have to struggle with. And it, it, it zapped me too. Yeah, that's what's complicated for me. Um, it didn't affect me quite that same way because... I was trying to be maybe too pragmatic or zoomed out and analytical. I felt like there was a lot going on here. Like, but is he really fucking up her career? I mean, it seems like this manager dude is making her as inauthentic as possible to sell as many records as possible. And Jackson is getting in the way um, because of his, his issues, but not as severely as was posited because she's still super successful. And so as far as like what he's done to mess up her career, it seems like they also made a point of showing that she was able to recover from the Grammys to the extent that and she was going on our European tour. Yeah. European tour and doing all this stuff. Um, and we get to another scene where maybe it's not quite as simple as that, but the point being, um, I, I, I don't know. I, I took it as this manager being kind of, a, a dipshit evil mean person and really just wanting not really looking out for Ali as much as his own like metrics of what is success for him um i think you may be right there because i'm i'm not saying that what rez was saying was 100 percent the truth uh, okay but but it's still the way it affected jacks and I, I can i can relate to those things yeah and there's a part of me that's like jack come on talk back but jack has this a, a brilliant character for being a tough guy, he's actually quite gentlemanly. And I think if his persona, his reaction is just to sort of look you in the eye and take, take the criticism or the words that you're giving him. And he's like, all right, you know, but he's not going to verbally joust or fight it. And, and um, I think it's because he has, he has his own demons that. Yeah. And it was really hit to the core. So, yeah. So, oh. yeah. But I can't believe I skipped over one of my very favorite scenes of the whole thing. When he's coming back from rehab, um, Bobby actually is the one who's driving him home. So they're driving back from rehab and they oh, yeah. talk. And then as soon as Jack gets out of the car, he, uh, you know, he's, he's obviously very emotional. He just says something along the lines of, um, you know, it wasn't dad I idolized. It was you. And then he's, he starts to cry as he like closes the door and then, then it obviously affects Sam Elliott as Bobby super well. My favorite, one of my favorite scenes was certainly he like puts it in reverse and he like looks back so we can see him because he's looking backwards. Um, and he started to cry a little bit as he puts it in reverse and he drives out and I don't know, brother stuff, family stuff. It just. It, it was a good scene. It was a really good scene. Yeah. Yeah. Loved it. <laughs> so anyway, um, fast forward again to um, Jackson hearing that stuff from Rez about how he's still standing in the way of, of her career. But she says, you know what? Hey, our, my, my European tour got canceled. Uh, and the reason it got canceled was because she was looking out for um, Jackson and didn't want to leave for, for months while he was just coming out of rehab. And originally she was like, Rez, I want to bring him with me on tour. So he's at least there. And Rez was like, hell no. So she says, it was canceled. Um, like the label wants to do something else or just speaks vaguely that sort of it makes it hard to piece together that she was the one who decided to cancel it. Yeah. But, and I thought there was even more, more sharp uh, narrative there. I thought she said he 
I think it'd be great if he could come up on stage with me sometimes during the tour and we could perform these songs we did together. And Rez was like, there is no way. And, and actually I sided with the manager a little bit. It's like, yeah, if he comes on the trip, it's just like your husband and is, you know, he's in the hotel or whatever. That's one thing. But like for him to be a performer as part of your show, that's complicated. Um, but then she says something to the effect of like, well, if he's not coming, then I'm not going. And it's kind of an ultimatum and it turns out to be true. Did I, did I get that? No, I, I think you're right. Okay. I think you're right. And then, then really, if we get the timeline right, after that is when Rez is pissed off and he comes and says all that stuff to Jack. Yeah. Um, and so then, but when Allie talks to him about it in sort of these vague terms, oh, it's not happening. Um, she's being really sweet you can tell but you can also tell this is a great acting moment for for jack oh, that he's like he's crushed by it and he for right or wrong has in mind what rez said to him and um yeah that's the moment when he basically decides what's going to happen next because he's going to go visit her at a performance later that night but she has to go early obviously it's like okay i'll see you there um and he in a super powerful scene yet another he um he uh you know he gets into his truck like okay he's gonna go to the performance but no he just makes room in the garage he finds some pills that he has in the um in the truck gets loaded like oh no is he relapsing like no relapsing is the worst of our it's the least of our concern here because he grabs the belt and he hangs himself in the garage yeah because he just i don't know he can't he can't live with uh getting the way of his career or the the toll he's taking and if, as if that wasn't bad enough and hard enough to watch then you see his little dog come out and and hey where's where's my human and the dog's super sad too um and uh yeah that was that was pretty intense in many ways the emotional climax of the scene is pretty intense it really was and i wasn't necessarily expecting it either there's still a part of me that wants to ask the question like logan is there any way this movie could have ended some other way is there any way uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, this was the story being told. It would have been a different movie, yeah. Yeah, and it, yeah, it just would have been a different it's, movie. It's not a happy movie. No. And um, I guess that's just me masking the question of like, it, was, it, was it inevitable or I don't know what I'm asking. I mean, we don't need to psychoanalyze it that much, but it just, it hit me not only in the scene, but as a as just a powerful connecting of the dots of all the other aspects of the movie and the story and just made me think about the whole thing in its entirety, thinking through, you know, how it got to here and what could have been done and those sorts of things. And then I catch myself and I'm like, okay, it was just a movie, but I'm like, wow, it's, it's, a, it's a good movie though. It's really getting me that way. It felt real or plausible in a lot of ways. Yeah. 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 I really did. And then we zip. Well, it's not really zip, but a few, you know, yada, 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 not that much really. But then we have one final performance from uh, Allie. Her hair is back to normal hair color again. That is one of the things. And yeah. what she does is she sings a song that, um, that Jack had written in rehab. And um, it's, uh, well, I'll, I'll never love again, I guess. And uh, it, it seems very foreboding when you re rewind and think, oh, he wrote this in rehab thinking, because it's a good suicide note. Maybe he was thinking of it then, or maybe he was struggling with that then. Yeah. Uh, and then one of the, then another scene that gets you get, got me right at the end was when it switches from her singing it. It's like him singing it to her. Like, Oh, that's, yeah. a, that's a gut punch too. And then the movie is over like literally 60 seconds later. Yeah. So you, don't, you don't have any time to like recover, put yourself back together. It's just bam. Right. And there's a part of me that's kind of like, a little bit of a jerk or something because I, I, the movie just ends and I'm like, but, but I want to know what happens to Allie. Are there words on the screen? Who's, you know, based on a true story, right? We get closure on. <laughs> Allie went on to win 38 <laughs> Grammys and yeah, blah, blah, I blah. I don't know what I was looking for, but that's where the movie ended and where it needed to end. It, it made sense and I can't fault it at all. It's just my own issues of like i say if, if it's about the love story i guess that's where the, the love story has a conclusion there yeah um yeah and then it just yeah i just left sad but uh happy i saw the movie i i enjoyed the story and the whole experience even if i kept asking myself is there anything we could have done as <laughs> viewers of this movie to make it end differently how did we fail jack yeah how did we how did we as fans <laughs> i don't know 
So yeah, it's a good movie. Um, I really liked it. Really affected me um, emotionally, and and I think it's just well done. Yeah, I think so too. Um, definitely practically endorsed. Uh, we both recommend it. Easy movie. Well, maybe it's not easy to recommend, but it is a good movie. It's a good movie. <laughs> well, let's. Uh, we're taking a little time here. Let's get to our top five-ish list for the time for this time, and we've done similar things in the past, but I feel like it's most appropriate ever for our show this time. And I want to talk about um, the top five-ish list of Bradley Cooper performances, just because I'm still so amazed by how he went from just this, you know, pretty young guy. I mean, pretty guy who's young. Um, he's in Alias. Uh, I think he was in Sex in the City in an episode or something like that. Yeah. The Hangover is how I thought of him. Yeah. Then all of a sudden he just has these increasingly better performances um, to where I just think he's terrific now. So let's talk. Um, I'm going to go first with my nomination, okay? All right. Uh, American Sniper. That might be my favorite Bradley Cooper performance. Wow. That's number three on my list. Okay. I just, he had some more moments in there where he just uh, zinged me in a, in a, I don't know, I guess in a man sort of way, things that men deal with. I don't know. Anybody that was a very me? manly, manly movie. <laughs> um, what's your first? My first is The Star is Born. I thought this is a, his best performance, what we just saw. Um, I think it was the culmination of a lot of training and leading up to this kind of thing. Um, I was really impressed. Well, I loved this performance too. So since it was second for me and first for you, I think that'll, that'll average it to the number one on our list. Okay. For me, uh, I'll nominate Burnt. Did you ever see Burnt? No, I never saw that cooking movie. Um, sorry about that. I, I meant to. It was a mediocre I, movie, but his performance was one of the best things in it. So interesting. I liked it. And maybe I'm drawn to cooking stuff a little more, but I liked him in it, I will say. Gotcha. Okay. What's next? Uh, well, pretty high on my list, considering the seriousness of all these movies so far. Guardians of the Galaxy. I really, this it's across several movies, but just the first one, especially he plays rocket, the talking, not squirrel, um, raccoon. Is it? <laughs> I, I guess even though he doesn't like to be called a raccoon. Yeah. He's just got so much personality and it makes the movie that much more peppy. Um, and, and for being an animated character, really good stuff. Like it's, I loved it. Yeah. It shows range and not only just range, but it's just like really good too. So that's another one that every time I hear it, it's like, is this is really Bradley Cooper. He's really good. So that was on yeah. my list too. Then cool. I'm going to say American Hustle for my last one. Again, I'm not everyone liked it, but come on. Bradley Cooper was great in American Hustle. He was well, good. Yeah. It's not on my list, but sure. I can't, <laughs> I can't uh, discredit anything you're saying. Um, I would just add to that Silver Linings Playbook. Mm, okay. Um, which I thought he did a phenomenal job of. Well, I don't have to get into the story, but um, that's probably enough. I could keep going, but. Yeah, right. I mean, Silver Linings Playbook is a good one because that's the first hint where it's like, oh, maybe this guy is actually an actor, yeah. not just a pretty boy. So right. I, I agree that that was a good one. Um, and yeah, so I guess we both hit a David O. Russell one too. Yep. Uh, so I guess we'll stop there with six. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So the final list, top five-ish list, uh, A Star is Born, American Sniper, Guardians of the Galaxy, Burnt, American Hustle, Silver Linings Playbook. Love it. That's good. All right. Well, there you go. A star is born spoiled. And if you listen to that watching it first, we hope you can now fake it fairly well in whatever social situations you may need to. And that is this episode of the Practically Culture Spoiler Cast. Join us next week as we spoil. Oh, great. What are we spoiling? Probably First Man? Probably First Man, yeah. <laughs> All right. And we have the usual top five-ish list, and we chat about what we're watching. You can find more from us at practicallyculture.com, on YouTube, and in your favorite podcast app. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. I'm at Logan Bo Bob's at Bob Caswell. Send us a message. Ask us a question. Let us know how you like the show. Come back to us and get your pop culture spoiled. Thanks for rocking with us. Have a good one.